My name is Katie Abbott, and I am an assistant professor of gerontology and a Scripps Gerontology Center Research Fellow at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And we are delighted to spend a little time with you today to talk to you about um, our work with uh, advocating using um, the PELI instrument that we'll tell you about. I am joined by Alex Hepner who is the project manager of the Pelican Project. She also is a social worker and a Scripps Gerontology Center Research Fellow. A little bit about our team. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with our work, we are a collaborative and multidisciplinary team. Um, we call ourselves the Preference-Based Living Team. Our mission and goals are to help facilitate uh, preference-based living in terms of how person-centered care is delivered. We develop webinars, tip sheets, newsletter, and training videos for individuals who are both providers of care and receiving care. And recently we began working with guardians in the state of Ohio. And through our work uh, with these guardians, and in particular, Lori Lucan, Lucan, who is uh, the manager of the Guardian Assistance Program in the Cincinnati area, um, has encouraged us to develop these resources. And so we're delighted to partner with Guardians. Um, but again, this isn't only for Guardians. It could be uh, other individuals who are advocating for an individual. So as we get started here, I want to bring your attention to the question and answer box on WebEx because you can enter your questions and answers at any point in the webinar. And so here, what I'd like to point out is at the bottom of your screen to submit a question, look for that Q&A box located at the bottom right corner of your screen and type your question there and send it to us and then we can see your question. And we look forward to your questions. Um, we would love to be able to expand upon anything that we're talking about. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature to direct your questions to the host, which is Alex. Um, and so look for that chat box icon at the bottom of your screen. And when you click that, the chat box will appear on the right side. And just use that drop down arrow to select the host and type your message in the space and then press enter to send and we'll get that and we can help you with any technical issues that you might be having. Hopefully. We can be technology gremlin free today. So we wanted to pose some questions to you all today. So have you heard the term person-centered care, but maybe you aren't sure exactly what that means? Would you, be like, would you like to be able to advocate for an individual under guardianship by providing concrete steps for providers? Maybe do you seek ways to get to know an individual under your guardianship? And so um, you know, we wanted to, to think about these questions and, and what it might mean for individuals who are advocating for another individual, whether you're a guardian or a family member or a friend. So person-centered care is, is a, a sort of a philosophy of care, and long-term services and supports has been shifting toward this person-centered philosophy for quite some time now. And there are many definitions of person-centered care, but the, the fundamental aspect of person-centered care is that we seek to understand an individual's preferences, goals, and values, and honor them throughout the care delivery process. So you can think about it in terms of wrapping services around an individual instead of an individual having to conform to the services that they might need. So simply put, we talk about person-centered care as knowing the person and honoring their individual preferences. And so why do preferences matter? And we'll, we'll steer you to some resources for more information because obviously we, we only have an hour with you today. But one specific way to provide person-centered care is through preferences. And in all the definitions you'll find of person-centered care, preferences are you know, mentioned. And what we see if 
preferences are assessed and honored, we see residents with a greater sense of autonomy. We see individuals with improved quality of life. We see individuals with better emotional well-being. And what we also see from you know, the individuals providing the care, we see those care team members working more efficiently with their clients or the residents, spending their time where it has the greatest impact. And this also helps individuals who receive care maintain authorship of their own lives. The, the screenshot we have on the right there is a three-minute animated video that's on our website that you can go to learn more about this, um, this concept. So I want to shift gears and tell you about the PELI. So what is the PELI? And it stands for the Preferences for Everyday Living Inventory, and that's why we call it the PELI for short. This is a questionnaire that has been in development for over 15 years. And the goal is to, through a systematic process, learn more about an individual's most important preferences. It has, um, we have considerable evidence behind it. We have done many scientific tests with it and found it to be a valid and reliable measure. We have included the voices of over 500 older adults receiving services through home care and another 350 um, older adults receiving care through nursing homes. The full um, PELI consists of 72 questions, but each one is a standalone question. And so we have five key areas, such as um, personal care, such as social life, activities, and leisure. Um, and so knowing what's important to an individual helps provide person-centered care. And all of these resources we will show you towards the end of the webinar are available for free on our website, preferencebasedliving.com. I want to show you a couple of examples of sample PELI items. So this is one question. How important is it to you to choose when to get up in the morning? And what you see by the arrows here is that if it's important, if the person says, well, it's very somewhat important, or it's important but they can't do it, you can see that there's some places here for additional details on, okay, well, if this is important to you, well, what time do you like to get up in the morning? So this is the critical information that that people who are providing care need to know. It's not enough to just know if it's important or not. We need to know a little bit more and to dig a little bit deeper. Okay, well, if it's important, tell me more about that. If it's not important, you simply go to the next question. Um, now, I haven't gone in order here. I wanted to provide you with a variety of the different types of questions that are in the PELI. And so the next item example that I pulled here is, how important is it to you to have regular contact with friends? So we recognize that individuals um, who may be under guardianship or may not have family involved in their care, they may have friends. And so this is something that an individual would like to know. Is, is, is that important to you? And, and then which friends do you enjoy having regular contact with? And who are those individuals? Because that's the information that can help facilitate having those uh, interactions. And then in which ways do you like to keep in touch? And, in contact with them. And so again, this allows the individual to give you a little more detail. If it's not important, again, you skip to the next question. Another example is how important is it to you to have staff show you respect? So here, what's, what's very interesting is that most everybody says this is important, but where the, you know, the devil is in the detail about how do they like to be shown respect? And so we have some ideas below here. In which ways do you like staff to show you respect? For example, you might not care that they call you by your first name, or maybe you want them to address you as Mr. or Mrs. Um, perhaps you want them, you know, as, as you see here, knock before they enter the room. Perhaps you'd like them to, um, you know, do something else. And so that's the information that will help uh, convey to the staff, well, it's important for, for Mrs. Smith to be shown respect, and this is how she perceives that. This is how she wants that to be shown. 
Another example, how important is it to you to listen to music you like? So again, there's lots of music out there, but which kind of music is important here? And so again, this allows you, if this is an important item, will tell us more about what kind of music you like. Is there a favorite era? Um, do you have favorite musicians or musical groups? So again, all of this information can just allow you to facilitate the ability of that individual to listen to the music they like. And so our, our tagline for the, the Pelly project, the Pelican project, is knowing the person, honoring preferences, and improving quality of life. And where we're coming in on this webinar is that the Pelly can be a useful tool for advocacy. While we, um, you know, it provides an opportunity to get to know the individual, build insights, relationships, respect, and trust, it can also enhance your ability to contribute to care planning conferences and can support your role as an advocate by knowing what preferences need to be communicated to staff. And so at this point, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Alex Hefner, to walk you through our latest tip sheet. Now, we will send this tip sheet to you in an email as soon as it's completed. Right now, we're just finishing the final edit toward, on it, and we can get it to you this month. And so be assured if you are registered for the webinar that we will email it to you. If not, towards the end of the webinar, we will show you a way to sign up for our newsletter that will highlight you. So take it away, Alex. All righty. Thank you, Katie. And as Katie said, the Pelly can be an extremely useful tool for advocacy, but we realized that to better support these efforts, we needed to reframe these materials to kind of make this connection more clear. And so we developed this toolkit using the Pelly for Advocacy to advocate for person-centered care to, to, to help individuals in advocacy roles increase their abil ability to advocate for person-centered care. And so in this toolkit, we've outlined four approaches uh, to use the Pelly as a tool for advocacy. So assessing an individual's important preferences, integrating preferences into the plan of care, honoring preferences when the choice involves risk, or communicating preferences to enhance person-centered care. So an advocate can decide to take any of these approaches depending on the needs of the individual receiving care, uh, their relationship to that individual, and the amount of time they have available. Alrighty, I'm ready for the next one. <laughs> um, and so the first approach is assessing an individual's important preferences. So Pelly interviews provide a meaningful opportunity to get to know the individual and gather valuable insight that will help you know how to personalize care and enhance their quality of life. Whether you have just met the individual receiving care, if, you're, if they're your guardian and they're a, a new to you, or you already have an established relationship with them, assessing an individual's preferences is, is an approach that's appropriate regardless of the stage of your relationship. So learning an individual's preferences will help you understand what is important to that individual, help plan their care and daily activities, and advocate for their needs. Uh, we understand that time is often limited and the, the um, 72 items can, can seem kind of daunting. So we've included several strategies for using the Pelly to assess preferences. All right. um, so guard, guardians can focus on enhancing preferences that have already been assessed. So 16 of the Pelly questions are consistent with the minimum data set or the MDS 3.0 section F. Um, and so this is an assessment for preferences for customary routine and activities. And nursing home providers are required by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS, to complete the MDS assessment. So we suggest that um, advocates ask the provider for a copy of the MDS Section F. And, uh, and then when visiting with the individual, they can review their MDS responses and ask for more information about preferences that they said were important using the Pelly MDS version, which can be found on our Pelly Tools page of our website. So the Pelly version of the MDS has follow-up questions that'll help you get more information. Um, uh, yep, so then I'm ready for the, the next one. Um, so advocates wanting to complete the full 72 item Pelly, uh, we suggest maybe completing the interview over several visits. So it's not necessary to ask all of the 72 items in one sitting. A Pelly interview, like we said, can really help build a relationship, but if you're trying to rush through all the questions in a limited amount of time, you may miss out on meaningful conversations that you need to kind of gain that insight and trust into the individual. And additionally, it's important to consider the individual you're planning to interview. Um, 
people can often become tired or overwhelmed easily. And so if this is the case, attempting to complete an interview, you know, kind of hurried in one sitting may not be an enjoyable experience for either, um, either party. Um, we also encourage advocates to consider selecting relevant questions from the full PELI. So if time is limited or if you don't want to ask all 72, you can review the full PELI to identify which questions are most relevant. The PELI covers a range of preferences for everyday life and allows the flexibility to choose which questions you want to focus on. So maybe you want to focus on recreational preferences, such as the types of activities they most enjoy or whether or not they enjoy doing things in groups. Or maybe it's more important for the individual that their preferences for care and daily routine are known. So each question is a standalone item, and so that allows you to pick and choose uh, which are most relevant. Alrighty. Um, so if you don't want to do the full PELI but need more guidance as to which questions to select, uh, we suggest focusing on the top 10 preferences. So we conducted a study and identified the top 10 preferences of older adults receiving care. And those are watching or listening to TV, so preferences for watching or listening to TV, choosing what to eat, going outside, having privacy, listening to music, giving gifts, traveling or doing things away from here, uh, choosing the time to bathe or shower. And so it's important to note that having regular contact with family was also rated as part of the top 10. However, um, Individuals under guardianship may not have family or um, you know, family members may not be available to them. So it's also important to mention that although the top 10 places are a, a great place to start, um, everyone has unique priorities and interests that should be explored and honored um, to further enhance their person-centered care. So on our uh, toolkit that we've developed, the top 10 preferences and where to find them, so the number of the item in the PELI is included in that toolkit, and you can also review our tip sheet, uh, Top 10 Preferences Across LTSS Settings, which is found on the resources, resources page of our website for more information about, about those top 10. So regardless of which strategy you use to assess preferences, it's really important to familiarize yourself with the PELI. So we re recommend that you review the interview tips in Appendix A of our toolkit, um, and we also have a short training video called Interviewing Older Adults Using the PELI, and that is on our website. Um, and again, all of our resources, including this toolkit, as soon as we get it finished, uh, will be available on our website, um, free to use and download. But what if an individual cannot communicate their preferences? So this is a question that we uh, receive regularly, and it's one that is going to be very important to guardians, uh, especially because Individuals under guardianship may have cognitive impairment or developmental disabilities, mental health issues, or experience you know, any other barrier that prevents them from communicating their preferences verbally. And although verbal communication does you know, pose a challenge, it is still possible to learn about an individual's preferences when these barriers exist. So knowing that guardians often find themselves in this situation we included another appendix, so this is Appendix B, with alternative approaches to learn about an individual's preferences. The research shows that individuals with mild to moderate dementia can still report their preferences reliably and consistently. Um, and so we recommend approaching the individual three separate times on different days uh, to kind of give them a chance to um, be able to communicate their preferences. And so if, after you, you know, make these attempts and it's decided that the individual isn't going to be able to communicate verbally their preferences, uh, then they would, that's when you would refer to this Appendix B. And so the experience and observations of staff who provide care is a great alternative to um, having someone communicate their preferences. So you can ask staff, um, using the PELI as a guide, you can ask staff about how the individual responds in um, care or recreation scenarios. So you can ask direct care workers about um, what they've noticed regarding maybe the individual's preferred bathing time, their preferred routines for care, any preferences they have relating to relationships with staff or their environment. Direct care workers or dietary staff can help um, identify what the individual likes to eat as well as when or where they like to eat. And then recreation staff 
Um, you can ask about any observations they have regarding preferences related to independent activities. So if the individual enjoys maybe just sitting outside by themselves or working on coloring book or, um, or doing crossword puzzles, they, the recreation staff may also have information or observations about whether or not the individual likes to participate in groups, um, the entertainment events that they like to go to, um, if they watch movies with other individuals, if they like to exercise and, and different things like that. Um, and then Katie, I'll turn it back over to you to discuss how um, advocates can use their own observations. Thank you, Alex. So what we also have talked a lot about is that you can learn a lot from an individual by observation. And what we also know is that the ability to convey emotion is retained far into the, the process of dementia. And so this part of the brain remains relatively untouched until the very, very end stages of dementia. And so what we encourage individuals to do is to use their powers of observation to find out what preferred activities might be. And so here's some examples. So if you see an individual participating in a task, maintaining eye contact, where their eyes are following the object or the person, if they're looking around the room and responding to their environment by moving or saying something, they might be turning their body or moving toward a person or an object, that is indicating interest. That might be a preferred activity. Similarly, if you see someone laughing, singing, smiling, blowing kisses, um, stroking or gently touching other people, uh, reaching out warmly, responding to music, this is another indication of something that could be a preferred activity. And so I'll give you an example of something that might not be a preferred activity. So if you see signs of anger, anxiety, or sadness, these are some cues that maybe let's try some other strategies. A lot of this is about, you know, sort of, of trial and error. You try something and observe how did it go over and try something else if you get a response, you know, where someone might be expressed dispre expressing um, distress through yelling or cursing, shaking their fist, that 11 between the eyebrows where they might be drawing their eyebrows together and you see that line between the eyebrows. They might be clenching their teeth or narrowing their eyes. The anxiety, um, a repetitive calling out, a restlessness or wincing. Um, again, the lines across the forehead, the hand wringing, um, and then sadness, obviously, if, if someone is crying or frowning, eyes drooping or moaning. Um, those are signs that, let's try something else here. And so let me turn it back to Alex, who's going to talk next about integrating preferences into the care plan. Yeah. Uh, so this... The next approach we recommend is integrating the preferences into the care plan. So using the Pelly to personalize care offers benefits for the individual and as well as the communities that they, they, they're living in. So understanding and meeting preferences can enhance an individual's autonomy, their quality of life, their physical and emotional well-being. Um, it also supports a more holistic and effective care planning. And it strengthens trust and communication among residents and guardians and the nursing home staff as well. Um, in addition to complying with regulations that require care plans um, are, are reflect an individual's voice and preferences so that each person can experience a meaningful and enjoyable life. So the PELI will help advocates contribute to the development of a care plan that reflects and honors the individual's unique strengths and wishes. So guardians can prepare for the care planning meeting by collecting the PELI information prior to the meeting. So that can be done either by doing, you know, if, the, if you've done the interview, excuse me, the interview with them, or if you review preferences that maybe have already been assessed. So after you collect that information, you can then summarize the important preferences that you feel need to be discussed with the care planning team. And then during the meeting, you can ask the care team how the individual's preferences are being honored. Um, and if maybe there's a preference that isn't being honored, um, be open to working with the care team to help them kind of think of solutions to honoring some of these preferences. 
And so we recognize that not everyone, you're not always able to attend, although best practice is to attend care planning meetings. Um, but guardians and advocates are encouraged to provide input um, over the phone if, they, if they're not able to be there. And so providing areas of concern that you'd like to maybe you know, hear back about, asking for a summary of the care conference, uh, asking for a copy of the care plan to review, all of these are within the guardi a guardian's privileges. Next slide. And so we have um, more detailed information in Appendix C of the toolkit that we have put together for advocacy. And so this kind of will give you a little bit more steps in, and strategies and suggestions for integrating preferences into the care plan. And then back to you, Katie. Cool, all right. So we're chugging along, right? So we've talked about how do you assess preferences. We've talked about how you know can you assess preferences if the individual can communicate with you and as well if the individual is unable to communicate with you very well and then we've talked a little bit about how do you integrate those preferences into a plan of care but then there's another layer to this is that what if the individual has a preference that staff might consider is too risky or maybe they're refusing um, to take a medication or maybe they're refusing uh, some treatment, or um, they might be refusing a shower. And so, you know, there are things that um, might happen that staff are saying, well, this might be a preferred activity, but this is just too risky. We can't do this. And so we also have a toolkit that we developed in collaboration um, with some other scholars in this area that helps to promote shared decision making. And this was developed with a task force of over 50 individuals that included stakeholders representing every imaginable group from lawyers to regulatory to providers and family. Um, and the idea here behind this toolkit, we're just giving you a high level overview, is that it's a process. And this process of shared decision making, the first step is to identify and clarify the person's choice and preferences. So for example, is this choice a one-time request or a refusal of, I don't want to take this pill today, I don't want to shower without assistance today, or is it ongoing? I don't ever want to take this medication again. I don't want a feeding tube. If it's consistently expressed or perhaps um, you know, or is it a brief reaction to some other concern? So first you have to kind of get it, dig a little bit at what's going on here. Then discussing the choice and identifying options with the individual. You know, so here's where you can start to have a discussion where possible about, you know, the, how the choice may not be in the individual's best interest and maybe what some other options are. So maybe you don't like this medication because of side effects, so maybe there's another medication that could be attempted. Um, maybe, you know, somebody prefers to use a cane rather than the recommended walker because the walker makes her feel old and disabled. Um, and so she would rather risk a fall than have such a negative self-image to herself. So again, repeating back to the person your understanding of what he or she desires to choose or refuse to confirm that you understand each other. And then determining how to honor the choice and preferences is the next step. And then the final step is monitoring and making revisions to the plan. And in this toolkit, there are worksheets. There are sample worksheets and then blank worksheets that you can use to fill out and document the conversations. And so providers like this approach because it helps them mitigate risk and it also, and through this documentation process, and again, as I mentioned um, in the first, in the slide just before this, we have a video, a short training video that you can watch, as well as the toolkit and a tip sheet that are on our website for you. All right, and then I want to turn it back over to Alex to talk about communicating preferences to enhance person-centered care. I think this is my favorite part. Yeah, yeah. So this is our last approach um, for advocates. And so um, we've heard from care communities that 
they have they struggle to communicate preferences. And this makes sense because they have multiple departments and multiple shifts of staff. They may experience high staff turnover or utilize agency staff. So all of these things um, that are kind of part of the nature of, of a nursing home or care community make communication within the organization very challenging. But staff knowing the preferences of the individuals they care for is crucial to providing person-centered care. So to overcome barriers to communication, we, our team developed the preferences for everyday, uh, for activities and leisure, excuse me, cards, or PAL cards for short. And so these cards are a quick way to reference important preferences and um, travels with the individual throughout the organization. So um, PAL cards are personalized five by seven laminated cards and they reflect the individual's recreation and leisure preference information that uh, it can be gathered using either the eight items in the MDS or uh, using all of the, the 33 items from the PELI. So there's 33 recreation and leisure items in the PELI. And so the cards are then placed on a resident's uh, wheelchair walker or on their door as a way to communicate their important preferences to staff and other residents throughout the provider community. So the ideal location if the individual has um, a wheelchair or walker would be to put the card on the, their wheelchair or walker so it kind of travels with them throughout uh, the organization. So then the front of the PAL card includes an individual's name and a short bio, like, uh, biography. And then the back is uh, personalized to highlight the, the PELI recreation and leisure items that were most important to that person during their interview. And so the sections on the back is going to vary depending on the unique interests of each uh, person. So here are some pictures of some PAL cards in action. Uh, one's on a, the wheelchair there and another on a walker. And so PAL cards are, um, are a way to promote more personalized care. They prompt conversations between staff and volunteers and community members and other community members as well. And this all can kind of contribute to a greater interconnectedness and enhanced person-centered care. So findings from our pilot testing of the PAL cards um, revealed that they can be successfully used as conversation starters between the individual and their care team members or between volunteers or, be or even amongst you know, other residents in the facility. So uh, residents reported feeling that their, the PAL card gave care team members an opportunity to ask them questions to get to know them better. They stated their cards brought them joy and made them feel more recognized and important. They also reported that um, care team members at the facility would read their cards and then it would spark a conversation. And one unanticipated finding um, was that residents also reported uh, the PAL cards encouraged them to talk and get to know each other. So that was um, a really fun way and just kind of more proof that it is able to help spark these conversations. Um, then staff also reported that they liked having the individual's name in big, bold letters on the card to help start an introduction. And this is especially helpful for um, new staff or, or floating or agency staff that may not know uh, the residents in that community very well. And then even staff that have been there for a long time reported learning new things um, from having this card available. And so again, this kind of promotes more personalized care when the staff has this information. Next, yep. Um, and so we have a, a lot of resources available um, on our website to help uh, individuals who want to create PAL cards um, make that happen. And so we have a tip sheet that kind of is an overview of the process. We also have sample PAL cards if you'd like to look at um, some more and kind of see more of the information that, that goes on those. We also have the, down, the template is downloadable. Um, and so you will download the template and then kind of enter the, the preference information on there. We also have a step-by-step -step video that will walk you through the whole thing from downloading the template from the website and, uh, and um, then opening it up and, and typing that information in. Um, so all of the, these resources and more are available on under our resources page. We have um, a button just for PAL card resources. So anyone that wants to make PAL cards is able to, and again, these resources are free and available to download. Cool, thank you, Alex. So again, here is 
um, a screenshot of our home page of our website. And I'll walk you through a little bit more about some of our other resources um, that, that we have here. So you can see at the main menu we have our About page, which tells you a little bit more about all the team members that contribute to our project. The Pelly Tools page shows you access to all the different varieties of the, the Pelly questions, and our Resources tab, um, a Contact tab, and a Subscribe to Your Newsletter tab. So first, if you click through the Tools tab, so Alex has talked to you about the Pelly NH full version 2.0, and this version are all the questions with all of the detailed items. So this is the most expansive version of the Pelly. Again, remember, each item stands alone. So this, you can pick and choose which items, um, or you can, you can take a few items a, you know, every visit and ask five items each visit if you'd like. We also talked to you about the MDS Section 3.0 version. And so this is the item where you can add the detailed questions to those important items of the 16 MDS items. Now, what we also want to point out is we have this Pelly NH mid-level version 2.0. These are just the main questions. So how important is it to you to be around animals such as pets? But it doesn't include any of the detailed questions, such as, well, what kind of animals do you like to be around? And so we don't recommend this one if your goal is to, is to really get to know specific preferences about individuals. This was something that we had developed for a research tool and have left available on the website. And so the next item that you'll see here is what we call the rainbow pelly. And this one includes, we went through um, with individuals and, and worked with several individuals who detailed Questions that would be relevant to individuals who may identify as LGBTQ. And so here where we have, um, it addresses the needs of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, older adults residing in nursing homes. And so it's all the same main questions, but the updates in the details section um, help allow for them to bring out their preferences too. And so we have a um, complimentary tip sheet on sexual orientation and gender identity. If you're caring for an individual who may identify as L LGBT, please um, l access those resources because we have these available and they have been vetted by many organizations and individuals. Um, and so that's just, just as a kind of an FYI. Now on our resource page, Here's where we have all of these fantastic resources that Alex was talking to you about. You can see the training video button here where we have training videos on how to conduct a Pelly interview. These were professionally produced with real actors. Um, we have one on how do you integrate preferences into care. We have the one I mentioned about um, honoring preferences when the choice involved risk. This button down here has that training video and toolkit. The PAL card resources button has all the resources for making PAL cards. We also have lots of other resources here that we haven't even mentioned. We have a brochure that providers can download and customize that helps individuals that might be moving into their community understand that they will be asked about their preferences and why that matters. And so there's lots of resources here um, for people to utilize. All right. So please enter any questions into the chat box. I'm going to go through a few sort of little housekeeping slides um, next, but if you have questions, please enter them now because we want to make sure that we, we get to your questions. And even if you think of something after the webinar, we're going to show you how to reach out to us. So first, please sign up for our monthly newsletter. We send out uh, a newsletter that has information about all of our latest resources, we try and include success stories from providers. We try and include um, information that may be relevant um, in terms of uh, other things that are going on. Um, maybe it's Residence Rights Month, and so that's something to think about. And so Alex has dropped the newsletter sign-up link into the chat box, so you can click right on that chat box link and sign up for our newsletter. So please do that. As we've mentioned several times, you can find more resources on our preferencebasedliving.com website. And Alex will drop this link into the chat box as well. 
Um, but we also have a helpline. You can call Alex directly. And so we want to hear from you, and we would love to hear, you know, what difficulties and successes you're having with advocating for an individual's preferences. We love to hear this information because it helps us, it challenges us to come up with more resources. Many of the resources on our page were because providers came to us and said, this is a problem. And so we're able to take it back to our team and problem solve and develop some resources to help. So please let us know. If there's a pain point, please let us know. We may not be able to solve it that day, but we certainly will do our best to try and come up with some ideas to help you problem solve about it. And it may lead to something else, another tool that we could help develop for others to use. And similarly, we love to share successes. This can be such a powerful experience. When someone's preferences are honored, they feel seen, they feel heard. There, you will see the smile beam from ear to ear. Um, and that's what most of the people in this, you know, industry and in this, um, you know, area want to do. And so please, send us your comments. We've got our email. We've got our helpline. Okay, so we want to stop here and thank you all um, for attending. We do have funding for our work. And uh, one of the things I love to say is that, Having someone fund your work means that they believe in you, and we've had a lot of people believe in us, which is fantastic, and we're grateful for that. And so let me stop here and go to some questions. Um, I have, I see a couple, and so let me start here. And then I also want to open it up to Lori. So Lori, I'm, I'm going to unmute you. Um, oh, yes. Lori, you want to unmute yourself. So yes. hi, Lori. Mm -hmm. So hi. Maybe, before I, maybe before I jump into some questions, are there any other, is there any other advice or, or pointers you'd like to tell guardians um, or advocates that we haven't talked about? I guess I would highlight um, your advice, a recommendation to take a few questions at a time. Usually the wards we have um, are limited in communication, and I think it will help um, just with attention and concentration to take a few questions at a time during visits. And also that will give you the opportunity to go into more detail on those questions and, and get better feedback than trying to do too much during a visit. So that I would highlight that recommendation. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so one question that we have is, which one or two preference areas or topics have been found to be of most interest or significance to nursing home residents? And so this is a great question. We've actually done some research on this. And Alex mentioned our tip sheet on the top 10 preferences, and that included a sample from the nursing home and a sample of individuals receiving home and community-based services. And so what I want to tell you right now are what were the top 10 for the nursing home residents. And so their top preferences focused on relationships with staff and those involved in their care. They were very much, the, the preferences that, raised, that rise to the top were staff showing you respect, staff showing how they care about you, choosing who you would like involved in discussions about your care, and choosing your medical professional. They also rated personal care, in particular how to care for your mouth and how frequently to bathe as very important preferences. Aspects of the environment were also important, and specifically these preferences were taking care of your personal belongings or things and keeping your room at a certain temperature. And we've even had a provider who had a fantastic success story with this room temperature question where they had an individual who was always complaining about the temperature of their room, and they took active steps to make this situation go away. And uh, we have it highlighted in one of our success stories. And so they were able to utilize a series of things where anybody, you know, from housekeeping, you know, to the nurses, if they were ever stopped by, they could offer her a, a lap blanket or they could ask her if the temperature was okay. So there were lots of strategies that went into this. And then a final item that really came to the surface for nursing home residents were emotional concerns, and in particular, the preference about doing what feels doing what feels helps you feel better, 
when you are upset. And so that's, those items could be very important for guardians to focus in on. Anything else, Lori or Alex, that you would add to that question? No, I don't have anything else to add. <laughs> okay, great. No, I don't have any. You covered it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Okay, so um, can you give an example of a creative approach to a resident preference that had risk involved? And so this one, um, I don't have a, a very specific approach, but, but what we, you know, um, occasionally what a resident might prefer to do um, is so clearly and patently unsafe to others. For example, if they want to continue to drive an electric wheelchair, despite the fact that the person has run into other individuals with it, um, that staff must override the resident's wishes. And so that's one thing that I wanted to mention. Um, but you know, it, it may not be appropriate to honor a resident's preferences when that person's maybe cognitive decline has progressed to the point that the decision making poses a clear safety risk to themselves or the community. But I do want to say that, again, without more information, it just might be that the staff uh, members think that it's not in the best interest of the resident. So maybe the resident wants to go outside um, and they want to go outside unaccompanied. Um, and so maybe they don't, as I mentioned, want to take the, the pill that their physician has prescribed because of a bad taste or because of perceived side effect. And so again, the, the idea that you can enter into a conversation to learn more about what this preference is and how you could um, potentially try and honor that preference is, is the goal of that, dis, that shared decision-making toolkit. So it's a process. And I think in the toolkit, there are some examples that you can um, access. All right, and then I see one more question. What have you found to be the responsiveness of nursing home staff in implementing resident preferences? Are there certain preferences areas that staff are more responsive to or successful at implementing? than other areas? And this is a great question. And Alex, I'll, I'll throw it to you after I get, take a stab at it. I think, you know, one area are activities and leisure. So, you know, typically um, there are activity staff members and if they can find some activities and leisure items that the individual enjoys doing, this is something that they typically are responsive towards and want to provide. Um, and so I would say activities and leisure are something, you know, and that's why we started with the PAL card, um, where we could communicate those preferences for activities and leisure, because then a volunteer could engage with the resident. Um, another family member who might be visiting could engage. And so it's something where um, there's, it, it's, it's a very easy thing to talk with individuals about. What we've also found is that personal care, there's a lot of interest in um, honoring personal care preferences. However, there may be structural barriers to doing that. So for example, um, if, if the staffing system is set up in a way that might not allow for a preferred bathing time, those are some things that also have to be thought about. And we do discuss some of that with in, our, in some of our other tip sheets. And so if you encounter something like that, reach out to us because we can help you um, with problem solving around those things. So Alex, anything that, that you would add in this situation? Um, no, I think you made a really great point. So that depending on, I guess, where the, the uh, provider is in their person-centered care journey, they may, like you said, have the structure set up where they aren't um, gonna be as open to you know, scheduling a, a bath or a bathing time when the individual wants. And so I guess being cognizant of that um, and kind of uh, being open to working with the, the provider and kind of, you know, explaining how this is going to improve the, the individual's, you know, experience and, and quality of life, um, but being aware that um, although the industry is shifting towards being more person-centered, it's, it's kind of a slow process. And so, 
you have to meet the, the provider where they're at as well um, while you're being an advocate. Um, and so having this information and kind of knowing that how important it is um, can then kind of be a tool to help hopefully drive um, the provider to, to coming up with solutions with you. That's a great point. And, and we can't um, emphasize enough how the whole industry is struggling with uh, retention of, of their workforce. And so, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a big issue um, that many providers, and so if, if they can't attract and retain their staff, then consistent assignment is, is almost impossible. And then therefore, the ability of staff to know the preferences of people becomes very challenging. And so that's, you know, again, something that you may encounter as an advocate is that you may have to sort of retrain people how, you know, the person under your guardianship is, you know, prefers a bath or a shower. Um, so that may be something that, that you have to continually reinforce. Lori, anything that, that you would add? No, I think those are very good points. And um, I always tell the guardians to go into a facility um, assuming everyone is there to help a person and to help them have a quality of life and try to join into that care team to make that happen. And then you deal with individual problems as they come up. So That's, that's, that's great advice. And, you know, a few things. We, we didn't cover everything on our tip sheet, and so I think one last note is, you know, if you're, again, if you're not sure how to introduce some of these things, um, you know, with the people that you're working with, let us know. Reach out to us. We're happy to help and, and sort of we can even do a little role playing and, and help you um, do that. I think some providers are going to recognize these aspects and encourage, you know, encourage you advocating for preferences and others may not. And so it's something where, um, again, we're, we're happy to help and, and support you. And so any, I don't, Alex, I don't see any other questions. Do you see any questions that I'm missing? Um, so I, so one that I thought of that came up um, when we were, during the presentation I was doing with uh, Lori and, and her guardians um, that I think would be relevant here is, so we're suggesting that um, guardians or advocates ask to see the, the PELI or the MDS assessment and so um, and kind of I guess gauging it, will the, will the provider actually let uh, the, the individual do that? And so I think, and I remember, and Laura, you can jump in, but um, the guardian, this is totally within their scope and within their privileges to be able to um, look at this information. And so I think it takes just some, maybe some educating on, um, on behalf of the, the guardian as to what kind of information that they have access to. Is that right, yes, Lori? That's, yes, that's true. They have. Um, a right as guardian, they stand in the ward shoes to look at their the records of the wards and the documents pertaining to their care. Yes, that's correct. And yes, it does sometimes involve education to the nursing home because um, they're sensitive to you know their residents' privacy, and they sometimes need to be educated on the guardian's authority. Great, thank you. Awesome, fantastic. Well, at this point, I don't see any more questions, and so I want to thank you all, and particularly Lori, thank you for joining us and for answering these questions, and um, thanks to Alex uh, for adding your insights. Um, as we said, don't hesitate to reach out, and we want to support your work as advocates, and um, thank you for the work that you do. So hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.